Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the IPSER Colloquium Series. Uh, today, we um, would invite you to uh, use the chat function as, um, as much as you'd like to offer comments and questions. Um, uh, the community will be able to engage with your comments and questions. And um, uh, then at the very end of today's talk, um, Gold uh, Okafo, uh, the doctoral student um, uh, who is going to moderate, will call upon you and unmute you. So, and then you'll have to accept that unmute um, in order so that you can advance your own um, question or comment yourself, and then we can have a bit of discussion. So as scientists, um, we often find inspiration uh, by going back through time. Um, we are fueled and galvanized not only by historical fact um, and thought, but by each other's disciplines, such as history, economics, archaeology, and sociology. Um, to me, this unprecedented moment uh, in our history, when worldwide, we as humans um, of heart and mind appear to have um, been awakened to the atrocities and to the glories of, um, you know, that have been long understood by those who have lived the Black life experience in America and abroad. Um, toward this end, uh, we're honored to have our guest today. Um, Carol C.R. Gibbs is here um, to take us in his time machine uh, and broaden our minds to have his research be a catalyst for inspiration and perhaps um, to bring us the winds of hope and strength um, so that we may ask the tougher, more controversial questions that uh, may have the potential to effect change. So today at IPSER, we're going to hear about the bones, the heart, the liver, spleen, and the mind of Black American culture from its roots in slavery through to today. Um, our guest is world-renowned historian Carol C.R. Gibbs, who has written many books on African-American lives, um, his book on uh, Black Inventors is um, one of my favorites of the of the books that he's read. He has so many; it's hard to catch up. Um, to a historical celebration of pro a prosperous and perilous time in Georgetown in the United States, um, where he retells the story of a vibrant community of African Americans through slavery, emancipation, segregation, prosperity, suffering, and hope. Um, Carol Gibbs, in addition to writing six books. Um, is a Howard University graduate and a DC Humanities Council scholar. Um, he's been featured in countless documentaries on the History Channel and on, on networks throughout the world. Um, he wrote and narrated a 13-part miniseries called Sketches in Color um, that accompanied the acclaimed PBS series The Civil War. Uh, Carol C.R. Gibbs is a much sought after speaker who has graciously agreed to join us today from his home in Washington, D.C. Um, via Zoom to talk to us about Africa, enslavement, and the making of Black American culture. So Carol Gibbs, we are so deeply honored to have you. Please join me in welcoming Carol C.R. Gibbs to Ipser's talk series today. Welcome to Ipser. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be with you. Let's, let's get started. Right now, you're looking at a map of the African continent. And we understand that Africa is the oldest and most enduring landmass in the world. When you stand on African soil, 97% of what's under your feet has been in place for more than 300 years. It is the second largest continent. And of course, it is the birthplace of humanity. Next. As we look at the waters of Victoria Falls uh, tumbling all along the river, we also know that the local African people call it Mosi Oyotunya, the smoke that thunders. We are called to mind just how often the African continent has tantalized and confounded the explorers and scientists that have sought to plunder her treasures and purloin her mysteries. 
when, when Shakespeare wrote about Africa, he said, I speak of Africa and golden joys. And there is an old Arab saying that he who has drunk of the waters of Africa will drink again. Next. I mentioned a moment ago about how, if we can go back to the previous one, that Africa is the birthplace of humanity. There was a time when the home of all, humo, all the world's homo sapiens was in Africa. And then the peopling of the earth began and African people moved into diverse regions of the globe, uh, spangling the continent with colors and different sizes. But at the root is the African people. Next slide. Fire, evidence that a human ancestors tamed fire in South Africa more than a million years ago. And this is a major step forward with respect to the smelting, the shaping of metals. There is hardly an aspect of modern society that in some way does not reflect the conquering of, of iron ore in one way or another. Next. The first stone tools. As I said a moment ago, the first control use of fire, the earliest bow and arrow, all come to us from old Africa. Next. What we have not fully understood is the nature of invention and innovation that began in old Africa. For something like 500,000 years, Africa was in the forefront of all human technological progress. Next. We may be humorous when we think about how the ancient Africans were the first nerds, that the birth of technology can be traced back to the continent's southern tip. And anyone, next, who would study the contributions of, of Africa must connect that with science, for it is indeed Africa is the home of science as well. It is through the process of observation and, in spirit and experimentation that we get the kinds of finds we, we, that we come to see today. The blood red marking scored into stone found inside an African cave is the earliest example of a drawing made by humans and predates all previous examples by 30,000 years. And the mark on the stone and blood red ochre itself, a medium of, of, of religion and of science, is that of a hashtag 30,000 years ago. Next slide. The beginnings of chemistry, we trace back to old Africa as well. And we find that in South Africa's border cave, uh, scientists not only found evidence of ostrich shell beads, but wooden digging sticks and uh, that were used to apply poison. So that the earliest use of poisons, we, we, we trace back to South Africa. Next. In Mali, archaeologists have found what might be considered certainly the oldest pottery in Africa. The sherds date back to 9,400 years be for the common era at a time when climate fluctuation changed the area's desert to grassland. And researchers believe that this pottery was invented there to store and cook new plant foods. Next. You may have wondered how does this old knowledge influence us today? Africa is the home of the kola nut, and for centuries, kola nuts have played a, a, an important role in West African cultural ceremonies. He who brings kola brings life. Rich in caffeine, the kola nut is believed to fight fatigue, heal headaches, and restore sexual virility. The nut is sacrificed during marriages and funerals. It is given as gifts to family, friends, and even strangers. It is a critical ingredient in the world's most popular soft drink, Coca-Cola invented in Georgia in 1886 by an ex-Confederate Lieutenant Colonel J.S. Pemberton. 
if you look at this market in West Africa, we get a way in, we, we get a key in the way in which Africa most subtly has influenced America and the world. Uh, there are items at the lower right hand side that some of you will automatically recognize as, as uh, yams, as sweet potatoes, the, the, the African word for eating yambi. Uh, it comes from that particular region of the continent. And so we, we begin to see that Africa's influence is, covers a vast range of human endeavors. Next. That we get a sense of early philosophy and early religion if we but choose to look at the African beginnings. Next the world's earliest multi-genius, Imhotep, uh, comes to us from the Northeast regions of, of Africa, from the dawn of civilization to the age of Cleopatra, and eventually to modern movie myth. One man's name repeats itself. His name means he who comes in peace. He is the first person in history to emerge as a man who is a master of the art of, of a doctor, the skill of an architect, the soothsayer and sage. And again, his name means he who comes in peace. He is the designer next of the pyramid. And shown here as a deity, he would inspire other civilizations to, uh, to create noted individuals like Aesculapius here depicted as a deity invented Egyptian pyramids more than 4,600 years ago. Next. When we look at the influence of, of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, we find yet another way Africa's imprint is on us today, for we can actually trace back beyond Greek, beyond Phoenicia, Letters in our current alphabet. We only have time to talk about a couple, but for example, the letter H, based on the Egyptian hieroglyph of a fence, it has come down to us as H. We, the letter M, 4,000 years ago, Egyptians drew a vertical wavy line with five peaks to denote water. The Semites reduced the number of waves to three in about 1800 BC. The Phoenicians further refined it. But when we look at it, the peaks have become zigzags and the structure was made horizontal. RM in today's sound and appearance. Next. The only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that still stands today, the pyramids. Again, there's another old saying. Uh, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids. These next enduring symbols to science and ingenuity, to man's ability to reach up off the surface of the planet and into the stars. Next. And we find even more pyramids as we move south of ancient Egypt and into Nubia also known as Kush. We, we think the name Nubia uh, comes from the ancient Egyptian word Nub, which means gold. And it was a power in the Nile Valley for more than 5,000 years. Next. The ideas of inner Africa found fruition and development is they moved up the Nile. And so as we look at this headline from the New York Times from March the 1st, 1979, we see that the evidence of the earliest monarchy, the earliest system of government by a king or queen come to us from the Nile Valley and were adopted by other cultures and then passed out and around. Next. and Africa has produced its share of strong women leaders. 
one of them out of a cadre of fantastic female kings was Hatshepsut, who, as you see in the lower right corner, wrote, no one rebels against me in all the lands. All foreign lands are my subjects. Her name means in part, foremost lady, foremost lady, Queen Hatshepsut of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. Next. But we have so many others. Her reputation was already legend when the world was still ancient, the Queen of Sheba. In the Quran, he, she is called Bilkas. She is also known as Makida. And here she is with a retinue of her followers. Uh, we believe this may very well be uh, her, her legendary visit to King Solomon of Sheba. Uh, to King Solomon, rather, of Israel. Next. I mentioned that there were wonders that people were trying to unravel. This is yet another one in the area in the Nile Valley of Napta. We also find the Stonehenge of the Sahara, that Africans too erected large plinths or monoliths in an area already well known to the people of the region 12,500 years ago. Next. The fifth century gold coin of King Ibana of the Northeastern African Kingdom of Aksum. Aksumite currency such as this is the earliest known indigenous African coinage. These coins were first issued and circulated by King Indubis around 270 AD and continued until the seventh century. The Kephalea of the Persian scholar and religious leader Mahdi named Aksum as one of the four great empires of the world, along with Rome and Persia and China. And yet, friends, the odds are we have heard of Rome. We have encountered a mention or two of Persia and or China, but no less about this African kingdom, about which we deserve to know so much more. Next. We regard the great cathedrals of Europe with awe and wonder. And yet, under a similar religious impulse, we have 11 monolithic rock-cut churches in Ethiopia that you can visit. It is one of the largest collection of rock-hewn churches in the world and is on the world, the UN's World Heritage List. Uh, uh, imagine that a belief in God caused these people 900 years ago to begin the construction of cathedrals out of hewn rock. The, the observers have called them prayers in stone and pilgrims still come there today. But the story begins that uh, the King Lalibala of the Zagwe dynasty of Ethiopia uh, was the man who was driven to create a new Jerusalem in Africa. And we knew he was special for when he was born, when he came wet out of his mother's womb, a cloud of bees descended around him and his full name means that even the bees recognize his kingship. Next. So to get a better sense of the rock cut churches of Lalibala in Ethiopia, this upper map gives you a sense of their proximity and how I just showed you the Church of St. George, which is the, uh, you see on your image to the upper right, Georgis. But if we went to Medhani Alim on your far left about center, that church is even larger than Georgis in the Church of St. George. And yet few people know about these prayers in stone. Next slide. West Africa has its own unique expressions of reverence to the temples of education and religion. So we have the, uh, the great religious center of Timbuktu. We have below here, Jenna's Grand Mosque on the banks of the Niger River. Next. 
imagine another temple of learning inside Timbuktu. And we find that Africa was not unknown. That as some historians have, have said, uh, there's a book called The History of Nations printed in 1906 that talks about the African continent. It is no recent discovery. It is not a new world like America or Australia. While yet Europe was the home of wandering barbarians, one of the most wonderful civilizations on record, had begun to work out its destiny on the banks of the Nile. And soon after, on the banks of the Niger, we find Timbuktu. And here we have an astronomy text depicting the rotation of the heavens, copied in 1733 from an even older manuscript, in the legendary city of Timbuktu in Mali. Next. Meet the 14th century African king who was, for his time, the richest man in the world. And we're talking about Mansa Musa, who in order to make his Hajj carried thousands of people out in his retinue, out of Mali in West Africa, to Cairo and on to Mecca. And he was an amazing individual. There would be people who would wonder how you, where did you come from? Where did all this money come from? And Mansa Musa uh, would tell the story of how his predecessor, Abu Bakari, had disappeared. Uh, his brother wanted to know the limits of the Atlantic Ocean. And so we believe that somehow about 13, 10, 13, 11, he sent fleets of African ships across the Atlantic. And Musa, his brother, took his place, bringing so much gold out of West Africa that he depressed the regional price of gold in Cairo. Next. As we look at the little known achievements of, of Africa in science and diplomacy, in a range of, of other endeavors, intellectual endeavors, we are reminded that even today, there is a place in Mali that honors a document that is older than the Magna Carta, older than the Declaration of, 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 of Human Rights coming out of England or France. It is called the Mandan Charter. It is called the Mandan Charter. And during the time of the Empire of Mali, uh, it was declared in oral form. It, the, it uh, contained a preamble of seven chapters advocating social peace and diversity, the inviability of the human being, education, the integrity of the motherland, food security, the abolition of slavery by, by raid, and the freedom of expression and trade. And yet there are those who refer to Africa as a land of s-hole countries. But this is the information, if it were better known, that would help to recognize and restore Africa's place, next slide, and contributions to America. Not all of these are bygone kingdoms or, and empires either. But what we see here is from the religious center of the Yoruba people in Nigeria, Ife. They astounded the world with their creations of their sculpted heads cast from bronze or copper that were first um, modeled in clay and then baked. The striations, the beauty of the sculptures astounded the world when they were discovered a bit more than a century ago. Next. So when we talk about the lost kingdoms and empires, there are still echoes, there are hints, there are vibrant hints of Africa's past splendor that exist even on the continent today for those who care to look. It is out of these nation states that many of the, those who would later be involved, enmeshed in the Atlantic slave trade would find themselves. Next. And even then, at this critical period in, in the history when Africa is known by the resources that others have moved in to take, we have the Gold Coast. We have the, if you start from lower left and go along the hump, 
the grain coast, not from uh, uh, anything other than the Malagata pepper. It, 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 it so tickled the taste buds of Europe that they were known as the grains of paradise, and you can buy them today. Then we come down to the rice coast, the ivory coast for the elephant's teeth it, that were extracted from that region of West Africa. And then of course, we have the much better known Gold Coast where Ghana is today. And of course, still later uh, uh, to, the, uh, west, to the east, we have the Slave Coast. But enslaved people, next slide, were kidnapped and captured. But understand that simply defining them as slaves robs them of their humanity. They were proud people. They were from a spangling of different ethnic groups. Bambara, Baga, Gribo, Mindi, Sanufo, Bobo, Yoruba, Ibo, Kota, Teke, Tikar, Mafa, and so many more. Next. The first European explorers to Africa did not come knocking, kicking down doors. We see in this document from 1605, an early account of the Gold Coast showing a king in his pavilion with European visitors at his feet. Next slide. In Central Africa, we have an image of a Dutch delegation prostrating themselves before the Mani Congo, the king of the Congo, Dom Alfonso, who is shown wearing European boots and a miniature gold cross on one elbow. And if you look above his, uh, uh, or just below rather, his chandelier, it says Dom Alvare, the king of the Congo. So although Hollywood has attempted to show one, uh, uh, an, a mythological aspect of Africa, it was not always a land of suffering and blight. When they talked about darkest Africa, the only thing dark about Africa is our ignorance of it. Next slide. For we find that slavery was practiced in Europe, that the word Slav itself comes from the word slave. And at this point in the history of Rome, for example, had nothing to automatically do with African people. Next. Next, please. This is a, a, an ancient painting of the enslavement of the Helvetians by the Romans. And Helvetia was an area of Northern Europe, roughly where Switzerland is. And here we see men who are literally have to pass under the yoke, the yoke of enslavement. And all of the implements of torture are surrounding them to remind them of their inferior status. Their Roman overlords are, uh, uh, have placed the heads of their leaders on either side of them on, in pikes. And the men are forced to duck under that yoke, reducing them to chattel, reducing them to cattle. Next. We find that Europeans uh, are often uh, committed shocking acts of brutality on their own. The, the Children's Crusade in the 1200s at a, a moment's pause in the armed attempts by European nations to rescue the temples of Christianity, we have the, a monk who suggests that maybe children can somehow pry the shrines of Christianity from the arms of Islam. And so this monk persuades thousands of children to come out of the homes of the nations of Europe and come down to the northern Mediterranean sea coast, where we find that Europeans sell these children in for slavery. And so the children's crusade is actually a failure. Next. We find that the many nations engaged in the slave trade, that there was an international trade uh, in the medieval period that took in Europeans as well as Africans. Next. But when 
as the needs of the new world began to eclipse those of the old world and the focus shifted to Africa, we began to get the Ma'afa, the great calamity. Some scholars have called it the Ma'agamizi. Next slide. Which means the same thing. It was by all accounts, shocking brutality. Next. Strange things were common. A slave captain flogged a child under a year old to death because it refused to eat. A coal of fire was kept in the hand of one man who refused food and a piece of yam in the other till he should eat. They were forced on in, in, to lie between decks, but could neither sit nor stand upright. 16 inches in width was the space allotted to each one. And when storm kept the hatches closed, suffocation did its wor work. The dead carcasses were found locked in the same fetters as this book says, with a still grasping wretch. Next. So that African slavery was one of the great crimes of the world, where even living Africans were thrown overboard. We have a multiplicity of examples, but the Zong, what happened aboard the Zong in 1781, Le Rodure in 1812, possibly to uh, 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 cheat the insurance adjusters. Next slide. But at every point, on the coast of Africa and on countless slave ships, the Africans fought back. Next. And this is what we must understand. The scholar James Walvin reminds us that Africans were shipped primarily on European ships. They were bought and traded for goods imported or transshipped through Europe. Profits of the slave trade flowed back to Europe. In fact, all major Western European maritime nations sought with varying degrees of success to create a niche for themselves in the slave trade. So Europe was from the first intimately involved with the development of the slave trade and slavery. Indeed, the slave trade was as much European as it was African or American. Next. But we had Africans who spoke against the slave trade. The first abolitionist was not William Lloyd Garrison, nor was it Frederick Douglass. And so we have King Dom Garcia of the Congo receiving uh, Capuchin missionaries. He was the descendant of the first Congo king to adopt Catholicism. One of the earliest of the black abolitionists was Lorenco Mendonca da Silva, a descendant of the same royal family, which began to advocate abolition at the Vatican and in Lisbon. Next. The horrors of the transatlantic slave trade, its, its extent and its pervasiveness is shown in this map. Next. These cradles of misery that could carry uh, 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 hundreds of enslaved, kidnapped, captured Africans across the bloody waters of the Atlantic in a matter of weeks. Next slide. In more modern times, some of the leading African societies that were involved have asked for forgiveness. I went to such a ceremony in Washington, DC. Next slide. And these sites where the last site of Mother Africa was seen by millions of Africans are now places of pilgrimage by the current generation of African Americans. Next slide. The slave trade was part of a conveyor belt of suffering and death as well as wealth and manufactured goods. Next. When we try to assess it, we try to claw through the pages, the dusty pages, we come up with a minimum number of 12,500,000. And the one site that you can go see the countries that participated directly, the, the decades of the transatlantic slave trade, the Ma'afa or the Ma'agamizi, is in the transatlantic slave trade database maintained by Emory University. 
More than 20,000 voyages have they documented. Next. And still in Europe, we have evidence of how lucrative this trade was along the River Mersey in Liverpool. We have the Gory Warehouses, named after a place in West Africa. Next slide. And again, we remind you that at every turn, next, the Africans fought back on the coast, next, and on board the ship. The Amistad is a wonderful example, 1842, of the Africans gaining the upper hand, next, was even the subject of a movie. And in the transatlantic slave trade database, you, you can manipulate and, and find out for yourself in their vast database, the different types of resistance. Vessels, boats attacked from shore. Vessels attacked from shore. Outright slave insurrections. Next. But there was something unexpected in this maelstrom of suffering and death. The Africans Africanized North, Central, and South America. This was not expected, not even conceived. Next, but every place that the Africans landed, they left their culture, their input in language. The city of Charleston, where almost half of all slaves brought to America first set foot on U.S. soil, is finally going to apologize for its role in slavery. Next. The nation's capital had a vivid and bloody connection to the slave trade in New Orleans, as this advertisement shows from a Washington, D.C. newspaper. Next. 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 Implements of coercion, for no one would automatically and meekly accept enslavement. It had to be enforced by barbaric methods of torture. The one in the middle row on the far hand side is a speculum oris, which was jammed into the enslaved person's mouth and twisted until it forced its mouth open and food was shoved in. Next. And the concern, the worst nightmare, the, the specter of slave revolts, we, the, the recommendations were proven in the government of Savannah, we present as a grievance that there are not enough patrols appointed through the country to keep the Negroes in proper subjection, agreeable to the Patrol Act. Next. Extracts from the Slave Crow, a stomach churning list of the various and sundry methods of maintaining physically violent, next slide, methods of control of a people who sought, in, in sought their freedom. The first people that were hung in Charleston were Harry and Janie, husband and wife, who were slaves of Mr. Christopher Black. Mr. Black had them whipped and they planned to kill the whole family. They poisoned their breakfast one morning and if two of the family hadn't overslept, they too would have been dead. The others died almost instantly. But these freedom-seeking Black folk next were hung in Charleston. Another enslaved person testified when slaves run away and their masters catch them to the stockade, they go where they'd be whipped every other week for a number of months. And for God's sake, don't let a slave be catch with pencil and paper. That was a major crime. You might as well kill your master or your missus. Next slide. So there was fear of education, education denied. And yet that did not stop the plots and intended insurrectionary plots. Next. Both the North and South benefited from the slave trade. This is the William Vernon House built on profits from the slave trade from Newport, Rhode Island. Next. New Amsterdam, what would come to be known as the Big Apple, still today has the slave graveyard, the African slave graveyard, reminding us of the economically critical role of the slave trade 
in New York City. Next. And so where everywhere slavery laid its spore, you began to see these sorts of scenes in North and South. Next slide. Going to market, a scene near Savannah, Georgia. But these African women bringing their ways of balancing goods on their heads. Next slide. The Africanization of America would continue. And yes, this was a horrible system of exploitation and, and bloody appropriation, which the country has yet to deal with. Next. A good moor and an excellent plowman in his own handwriting, George Washington notes on his slaves in his ownership from the centerpiece of a controversial new uh, uh, exhibit. Next. And none of the so-called founding fathers, and this is a description of enslaved Africans fleeing one of George Washington's plantations, seem to be aware of the contradiction, next slide, of claiming liberty and justice for themselves to get away from England while denying it to tens of thousands of other people because of the color of their skin. Lafayette would go on to say that he would have never fought for American independence had he known that he was involved in maintaining a land of enslavement. Next. And for those courageous and hardy few who decided that they would do something to combat the spreading plague of slavery, history has shown them very little attention. I just want to share with you Robert Carter III of Nominee Hall, a contemporary of Jefferson and Madison and Washington, who freed all of his 500 enslaved people and was written out of the history books. There's even now today only one book called The First Emancipator by Levy on this courageous stand that this man took. Next. Attempted slave uprisings, even in the nation's capital, even in Georgetown, and this information is not taught in the city schools. Georgetown, 1802, and I find these references no less than in the papers of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Next. We acknowledge that the uh, most slave owned, most white folk did not own slaves, but there were they were still part of this system, part of a system in which there were thousands of other enslaved owners, and because of an insidious agreement with death and a covenant with hell, there were whites who would go down to defeat in the Civil War by backing this inhumane system. Next. So when we see that uh, six million non-slave holding whites, a million uh, members of families holding five or more enslaved, another million members, families holding one or more slaves. And that in 1860, the year before the Civil War begins, a quarter million free blacks. Next, a testament to their own skill. But even religion is turned into the service of slavery. Next. Too many pastors and preachers didn't speak out. And even though Frederick Douglass says, acknowledges in my bondage and my freedom that he knew that what was taught that so favored their perpetual enslavement wasn't true. He knew that others still bought it. Next. William Craft. I have often seen slaves tortured in every conceivable manner. I have seen them hunted down and torn by bloodhounds. I have seen them shamefully beaten, next, and branded with hot irons. Here is a uh, uh, recreated a drawing of a slave plantation that once stood in downtown Washington overlooking the, war, the wharf and stretched in its farthest reaches up to, ironically, almost where the National Museum of African American History and Culture stands today. Next. but how to define black people. And so the definition of Negro in the first American edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica considerably described black 
people as a race of impudence and idleness for treachery, revenge, cruelty, stealing, lying, profanity, and debauchery, that the black people were strangers of every sentiment of compassion and an awful example of the corruption of man when left to himself. Next, there are still people who believe this nonsense even today. And so when enslaved Africans were first given Christianity, it was given with the bias of maintaining, next slide, the power of enslavement over their lives. And there were businesses well known today that started out ensuring, at the lower right hand column, ensuring the lives of enslaved black people, not for the benefit of the slave, but for the benefit of their masters. You might recognize one. Next. Perhaps somebody recognizes the name Etna. Next. Brown Brothers Harriman began in the, with the profits of enslaved labor. Next. So we can make these connections. James Buck Duke, a man who would take the profits from tobacco and his enslaved workers and buy a college in North Carolina, a famous college. I'll let you figure out the name of that school. Next. Robert Morris, founder of the Bank of North America, founded in 1781 Willing and Morris, which dealt significantly in slave shipments and trading. His bank operated until 1923, and then uh, the assets were acquired by Wachovia, which was itself acquired by Wells Fargo. Next. And yet to the amazement of many, the Negroes are not only increased by fresh supplies from Africa and the West India Islands, but also very prolific among themselves. And they that are born here talk good English and affect our language, habits, and customs. Next slide. One example would be the Africanization of the English language. So along with words from Greece and, and Rome and the, uh, the languages uh, of England and France, we, we would find African words in American speech. Slavery was a major economic investment. It was three times greater than the total amount of all capital, North and South combined, invested in manufacturing, and almost three times the amount invested in railroads, and seven times the amount invested in banks. Next slide. It was a major economic interest. And as the nation headed toward the Civil War, next, as there was increasing discord about it, we come now to the Civil War, which black, many Blacks saw as the first coordinated assault against slavery. Next slide. And African soldiers would have a major impact in that. And emancipation. Next slide. That they had fought and bled 30,000 dead. But even in a post-Civil War America, African survivals in American culture would still be found. Next. West African cultures nevertheless supplied mainstream Southern society with Africanisms, words like okay and bogus and boogie woogie and bug and John and phony and yam and guy and honky and dig and fuzz, jam and jamboree and mumbo jumbo. Next slide. Come to us from Africa. Mulambo, another word for money. If anybody here is familiar with a song by Chuck Brown. He mentions Malambo, and I want money, y'all. I need some moolah, y'all. That is the Americanization of the Bantu word. Hippie, for someone aware, from which we get the word hip. Juki, and Tota, and Jeb. If you've ever heard the word jive, which means to speak foolishly or misleadingly, that comes from the Wolof people in Senegal and the Gambia of West Africa. Next. And so Africans brought new words to America and gave old words new meaning. A good example is what happened to the word bad. Another is the word sick. Oftentimes when people say that's sick or that's ill, what they mean is that it is really cool or good. Using a word to mean the opposite is West African custom. The Mandingo saying it is good, bad, they actually means it's very good. Remember Michael Jackson's song, I'm bad. Next. And so the, verb, the verbal wordplay, the skill of oratory, still distinguishes African-American culture 
and custom today. It is prized in the church and in love connections. Next. Next. Africans brought the building of their own homes to the earliest enslaved plantations, these work slave labor work camps. Next. But in their design, they, they show the world new methods of thought and new standards of beauty. For we find that in the design of an African village, in the design of an African cloth, in African hairstyles, we find the basics of fractal geometry, a repetitive pattern that you can follow into infinity. Next. And we found African rem cultural remnants in a variety of places, African games, next slide, African prayers, African religious, the banjo itself is an African instrument. Next, next, here we go. And it's hard to find mention of the African origins of the, of the banjo, but no less than Thomas Jefferson acknowledges the origins of the banjo or banzar. So deeply embedded in American culture that its African origins are forgotten or overlooked. Next. Here we find that a man named Joel Walker Sweeney popularized this African instrument, taking it across America and to the stages of the kings and queens of Europe. Next. We find a rediscovery of African holidays in Pinkster and Junkanoo, next slide, in the New World, next. A historic African-American celebration of spring, next. As we move to the close of my presentation, we see that African culture has influenced dance. The, the Charleston would be one simple way that we begin to see this. And we would even, next slide, talk about uh, forms of tap dance as well. The minstrel show has still maintains aspects of Africa. Next. Next, that talks about the Charleston. A game I played as a youngster, Ring Around the Rosie, is still played in parts of West Africa today. Next. Folk tales and sayings, what goes around comes around. Pretty is as pretty does. Actions speak louder than words. Next slide. We, along with others uh, like Johnny Appleseed or Calamity Jane, John Henry and Stack of Lee, next slide, are parts of black folk culture. The unique role of the black church as a focus of strength and an outlet for self-expression still loom large, next slide, in our community today. And so in many ways, it has been this spiritually felt dimension, next slide, that has helped African people cross a bridge over troubled waters. And we see similar ways of worship, next slide, similar forms of expression in vastly geographically separated communities. And one way we learned out of, away from slavery and discrimination was to secure an education, an uphill struggle to learn. Next slide. And so we come now to the stretch of our presentation. We look at the beginnings of African-American music, its development out of its West African musical roots. We see it split into jazz and non-jazz and, and the sacred traditions. Next slide. We see it gaining national and then worldwide attention in the 19th century through uh, uh, black choral groups and black church groups and individual black singers. Next slide. Who popularized the Negro spirituals and then gifted musicians, male and female, next slide, who popularized jazz. And so we can chart one of our greatest contributions in the arts from Africa all the way down to the 21st century.
Next slide. We have suffered stony the road we trod. Next slide. Bitter the chastening rod, but we have used boycotts. Next slide, long before the bus boycott. We have fought Jim Crow, not only in the South, but in the North, in stores and in churches. Next slide. And we have fought to keep alive our memory of our history through organizations like the Negro Academy. Next slide. The National Negro Memorial, which later would become the impetus for the National Museum of African American History. Next slide. And we praise and acknowledge those dedicated men and women who sought, next slide, to capture key moments of our history, of the glorious women, the awesome women that have, next slide, saved and inspired us, of those who have donated their lives toward truth and justice and equality. Next slide. These powerful sisters whose praises will be sung as long, next slide, as we have voices, even in times of difficulty, next slide. It will not stop our respect for our history. It reminds us and reminds the world, for those who care to know, next slide, while Tough times don't last, tough people do. We have many contradictions in our history, but those will be fought. Next slide. And we must all work together to dismantle the edifice of hate. Next. We have ways of doing this, be it Kwanzaa, next slide, or African-centered schools of people who are preserving our traditions in parts of Southern America today. Next. We're still learning. We're still finding that in many ways, these people left a record of their presence. Next. And we find more than an, uh, 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 5,000 African-Americans are moving to Ghana, next slide, to live. They want a more closer connection. It doesn't mean they'll forget this marvelous African-American history. Next a history of magnificent struggle, of awesome works of art and science. Next slide. But in the end, and this is the final image, people wonder how we still survived in this country. And so we close now with the observation of Amy Perry, who at the age of 82 told an interviewer in the 1930s, the first year after freedom, I go on to school on Mr. John Townsend's place down to Rockville. After peace, uh, peace declared, the colored people lived on cornmeal mush and salt water in the week and mush and vinegar on Sunday. Mind you that for Sunday, I don't see how we live, yet we is. And so that we can say that in a land hostile to our presence, jealous of our attempts to establish ourselves as dignified and equal human beings, yet we is. I'm C.R. Gibbs, and I thank you for your time and attention. Awesome. Um, hi, my name is Golda Clotho. I'm a third year PhD student um, in social psychology and I want to thank C.R. Gibbs for that wonderful talk. Um, although it is sobering at times, I think it's very important to talk about the history of Black people, especially um, as social psychologists who study how um, people interact with one another. It's important to know the history and the culture. Um, of, of people. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the questions. Um, for these questions, I'm going to unmute you. And uh, first, we're going to have a question from Skander. Skander, you're now allowed to talk. Let's 
standard. Um, I can ask a question for you. So first, who says thank you Is for being here? Hi. Hey, how are you guys doing? Great. Hi. Awesome. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for hosting this. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm African too. I'm from the North and, um, probably like, I didn't know 80% of, of, of why you, Mr. Gibbs presented. So I, I thank you for, for your time. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, this is, I like, this may be a bit unrelated, but it's really out of my curiosity with the racial inequality, um, you know, in the criminal justice system inherited from slavery. I'm sorry, I did. I didn't hear everything that Sander had to Sander had to say. Oh, uh, yeah, I apologize. I'll say it again. So I, I was just asking whether you think that the racial inequality in the criminal justice system is inherited from slavery. Yes. Uh, what we find is that many urban police departments were initially set up to control and surveil the movement of black people because of a fear of revolt. Uh, you can go back in New York City, for example, as far as 1741 and see slave revolts in New York City. And, and we know that the Congress of the United States uh, discussed and enacted methods to uh, make sure that a, a, a moving account was kept of the movements of Black people. Mm -hmm. So that from the beginning of this country, Africans were regarded as objects of fear and suspicion. And this, and this has been carried on through, uh, uh, through the police systems and down to the present day. There's another lecture I do called A Matter of Injustice, where I go into more detail. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Definitely. Thank you so much for answering that question. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for your interest. Yes, thank you for the question. Our next question comes from Professor Drew Jacoby Senor. Drew, I'm going to unmute you right now. Hello. Thank you for the for that lecture. That was terrific. And we don't normally uh, get this um, methodological perspective. So my question is coming from from. Uh, the perspective is of a psychologist uh, interested in understanding what the, the conversation uh, around this topic is in uh, your own field. So I'm wondering uh, how receptive uh, historians have been to uh, your thesis that African culture or African history and African American history has an equivalence to uh, European and American and traditional uh, American narratives and um, how that has changed and how you see it as perhaps changing going into the future. Thank you, Drew, for the question. I, I've seen the interest ebb and flow. Um, I, I saw it reach a peak in the 1960s, and then it, it, it began to drop off in the 1990s. But, but what I am happy to report is that there are a number of of movements um, across the country from young people who believe that studying the history of African people on the same level as you spend time uh, studying the history of European people will benefit not only students who are of African descent, but teach profound lessons to students who are interested from other races in how this fits into the American construct. So I'm glad to see that, that there are movements in the academic world uh, to, to, to bring this back out into prominence. All right, so our next question comes from Arthur Aaron. Arthur, I'm going to unmute you right now. Hi, thank you very much for that interesting talk. Um, when you were talking about slavery in Europe, even among non-African or non-Africans, uh, I was wondering whether there was slavery in other parts of the world, such as Asia, which was not connected very much to either Africa or Europe. The the short answer is yes. What we what we probably need to do is to define uh, 
the, the uh, slavery um, even inside Africa as well as around the world. So there are various forms that can range from domestic servitude to outright chattel slavery, which it, we, and we have peonage or debt slavery as well, which, which we, we would put that in the middle. And so you, you find uh, domestic servitude where you take people into your household, but they still have rights. They are essentially what you might have found in England uh, uh, in the early 20th century, late 19th, as old family retainers. Um, but that had come down from a much earlier period when there was slavery in Europe. We find similar practices among the elite in, uh, in China, for example. And, and so, yes, the, we have various levels, similar institutions as we walk across the globe. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Our next question is from PhD student Lindsay Burnside. Um, unfortunately, she can't unmute, so I'm just going to ask the question for her. Um, she's wondering how our perception, or rather ignorance, of the continent of Africa affects how we conduct social science today. Um, for example, we have a lot of weird participants, which are Western, educated, um, and developed. So how does our perception of Africa affect the way we do science today? It must be both frustrating and, 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 and seemingly insoluble how uh, we don't understand Africa. We do not understand Africans uh, 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 on a very basic level. And, and, and we don't understand how our stereotypical concepts infuriate Africans. I, I, I had them talk to me about how people will come up to them and, and to say, do you still live in trees when that was never the case? Or that they think that all Africans come in the same uh, 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 shade or, or, or hair texture. What, what we need is a, frankly, from the cradle up, education about the world's second largest continent. One that renews, enlightens, and challenges us, and if nothing else, humanizes African people across the globe so that people can understand you're not looking at something that is not you. It is an expression. It is just like you have facets on a diamond. We're all part of the same stone. Thank you. All right, our next question is from Sian Yu Fan. Um, Sian Yu, I'm going to unmute you right now. A wonderful lecture. Um, so I'm a um, psychological anthropologist and I was actually wondering um, if you know of any narratives or accounts of slaves um, hearing voices or seeing apparitions or believing in prophecies that inspired or informed um, their movements for freedom um, and their revolts. Um, this was actually quite common in relation to colonialism all over Southeast Asia and in Burma where I do work. Um, and I was also wondering if, if, if you have encountered that in the narratives or in the accounts, um, how often were these apparitions or voices um, that they would hear of white folks, and how, how often were the figures and voices or prophecies uh, black folks? We often find uh, the stories of apparitions um, going from Nat Turner to Madam C.J. Walker. Uh, uh, Nat Turner was called Prophet Nat for a reason, and that is that he saw visions. Harriet Tubman was a tremendous believer in, in visions. It, it, there are those scholars today who believe that part of in her fits of unconsciousness, um, uh, that she interpreted that as a pathway to connecting with the spirit world. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker said that a vision came to her, a man from, from Africa, to give her the name for one of her hair care products. So we still, we still have this. There are still people who, 
whether you call it having second sight or visions, uh, this still goes on um, in the African-American community. The problem is, is that we, we, we have gotten so Europeanized, we're not supposed to admit stuff like that. But we come from a, 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 a group of people who believed that they stood at the intersection of those who had gone on before, those who were yet to come, and those who are here now. And that there was a free passage from one world to the next for those who were willing to listen and willing to observe. In my own family, uh, my mother and her aunts frequently saw things that I did not see. And, and these visions uh, in, in other contexts served as providing hope, uh, giving strength, and letting you know that although this was something difficult, it would not always endure and that we could look forward to a better and brighter day. So I, I would have you look at, at uh, to revisit uh, Prophet Nat, Nat Turner. Uh, I, I would say that's probably the best attested example of how a person who believed in, in visions and, and apparitions would have a major impact in a black resistance movement. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Our next one is from Professor Jason Akonofoa. Um, Jason, you are now unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us and sharing this information and allowing us to discuss it. Something that came to mind for me, a friend, longtime friend of mine is an editor at the Washington Post, and she just published an article about how uh, the, the infection rates of COVID-19 across the continent of Africa are surprisingly low. Uh, and it's particularly interesting how that is relative to African Americans in America. Um, and the idea being that uh, Black people are uh, not at risk of, or at some extreme risk of death or in, in many ways. However, black people in America are, which is a very small percentage of the black people on the planet. This comes back to my question about like, uh, or, or as it pertains to uh, how we think of, to this day, how we think of uh, um, Africans and the lack of uh, uh, understanding of the individual differences, like when you're speaking of the Southern edge uh, of Africa where tools were being made or things that were happening in other parts of the continent that it could both be a product of and a result or a product of and something that contributes to uh, Westerners not, you know, knowing or, or thinking about that there's actually uh, 54 different countries in the continent of Africa and that Egypt, uh, uh, Sudan and Botswana are incredibly different places. And similarly, there's 48, you know, countries in Asia and that Palestine, South Korea and Sri Lanka are completely different places in a way that that, that could be dehumanizing uh, in a psychological way to this day. It is important. When, when uh, my wife and I in 1997 took 26 people across the continent of Africa and, and from South Africa to watching the uh, Nile flow into the Mediterranean and, and right outside Alexandria, Egypt, we wanted to demonstrate the cultural unity, but within unity, there can be diversity. And it seems clear to me that uh, we never were in Africa quite what we become over here. And, and, and that, that is a proposition that I extend particularly to our health. But that also, you know, that extends to our diet. I mean, we're eating things over here that we, that we should not be eating. Uh, that rational people, period, should not be eating. But because we do not have the, a, a, a medical system that treats us equally, we suffer undue, unduly from it. So that we're seeing high rates of, of COVID-19 deaths um, in, in, as, as we become increasingly affected by it. 
However, I did research on Ebola and found out that in traditional times, African societies had methods of dealing with Ebola that were not known by Westerners. Uh, they all were already engaging in isolation. They were already engaging in traditional forms of herbal treatment. And there are some promising uh, uh, medicines that are being reviewed right now uh, that may yet surprise the world. Africa has, has uh, presented any number of cures for various diseases and maladies and simply not gotten the credit for it. Um, there is a cold treatment that is sold in health food stores and uh, supermarkets. Um, and it is based on a Zulu herbal treatment of its dilution of Paragonium sediades. Uh, it is, the, the, the trade name is Umka, U-M-C-K-A. Um, but we know that the Zulu had a pharmacopoeia of 800 different medicines that they were able to uh, repair wounds uh, and treat diseases as well as forms of mental illness. And all of these things need to be reevaluated, particularly since Africa still comprises a, a, a more than fair share of natural plants whose uh, healing substances still need to be medically evaluated by the East and by the West. <laughs> Does that Thank you. Yes, question? that's all of that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, I would just like to pop in and thank everyone. Um, Carol Gibbs, thank you so much for spending over an hour with us today. We cannot uh, thank you enough. It's been absolutely um, amazing. I wish we could have gotten into the long list of inventions that have come out of Africa and from African Americans. I mean, everything from toothpaste to the toothbrush. I mean, goodness, um, for those of you in the audience who are still here uh, listening, if you um, can get a copy of his book, um, you know, Black Inventors, it's brilliant. Um, Gold, uh, thank you so much for navigating through the, um, you know, the sort of uh, discussion uh, session and Elizabeth Peel, thank you so much for operating everything above, below, and behind the scenes. Um, uh, uh, Carol Gibbs, uh, is there any final word that you that, that you'd like to use? Any find a bit of wisdom you'd like to impart um, upon us before we say goodbye? I would first like to thank all of you, uh, Elizabeth and Gold and Dana. Um, thank you for this matchless opportunity. And I think that I'll just leave you with the fact that until we come to a better understanding of Africa, we will not come to a better understanding of ourselves. I think that's absolutely right because that is where we all come from. Absolutely. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and uh, thank you, um, Carol C.R. Gibbs. We're <laughs> greatly honored to have you today. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. If I can be of service at any time, please let me know. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm going to take you up. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh.